welcome everyone. Uh, we have another knowledge exchange today. It's called Reselling Content, Turning Editorial Content into se Sellable and Scalable Products. Thank you all for joining. Um, I will first tell a little bit of the background of this initiative. It's an exchange that's part of a series. Um, and these exchanges are organized, organized between media houses. They are funded by UNESCO and they're carried out by Free Press Unlimited. The idea of the initiative is to contribute to media viability by offering media houses a platform to exchange more intimate knowledge on their specific business models. So to allow other media to benefit as well, we, we make this recording and it will be published on a website of Free Press Unlimited. Uh, so in addition to this panelists, we have a few invited participants here today. Um, among them, a few media houses, some people from Free Press Unlimited and UNESCO. Um, and for those of you present, if you have any issues, please put them in the chat. If you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section or in the chat. We will pick them up at the end of the session. Um, today, we have a conversa conversation about reselling content. And we have with us Paula Miraglia, the CEO of Nexo Journal in Brazil and Laura Dykes, who is the manager of Mutante, which is based in Colombia. And we will focus on how a medium can de develop diverse types of content into products that can be resold. So I will now give the floor to Paula and Laura. Uh, maybe Paula, you can start with introducing Nexo Journal. Good morning, Evelyn. Good morning, Laura. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here to discuss such an important job to media outlets around the world. Uh, good morning to all of you who are there with us. I would like to start just saying that, um, excusing myself, there is a, a construction and my neighbors. So if you hear some noise, it's everything is okay. It's only about that. So uh, Nexo is a um, digital only uh, media organization launched six years ago in Brazil. We do explore our news, uh, news with context, we explore a lot of new formats, infographics, interactive material with uh, general coverage. We talk about Brazil and the world. Um, regarding our business model, we are a subscription-based um, organization with no advertisement. Uh, today, subscriptions uh, are responsible for almost 50% of our revenue. And I know we're going to talk more about this, uh, Laura, but just to share it with you guys, uh, I think that for us from the start, it was clear uh, when we were developing our business model and our editorial model, in a way they were combined, was that subscriptions would play an important role and a diversification of revenue streams would also play an important uh, role uh, in uh, our business model. Also, I think I would like to say that our, and we can talk more about this, uh, I strongly believe that the kind of journalism that we do is essential to have a subscription model or to have at least a model where a subscription plays such an important role. Uh, so good morning and looking forward to our conversation. Laura, could you continue with introducing Mutant? Well, thank you all of you to, for being here and the invitation. Um, I like to share my screen because um, I think Mutante is a bit difficult sometimes to understand. So I like you to, to understand well what, what we do. Um, Mutante is the first digital movement of citizen conversation in Colombia. That means that thousands of people meet on our platform to talk, understand and talk on the most pressing issues of our time. We do audience-based journalism. So we connect with individuals and organizations to build knowledge and public opinion. We detect problems, analyze imaginary stereotypes, gaps in information and misinformation. And as a result of those conversations, we disseminate informative and educational digital native content. Our agenda is mobilization and peace, mental health, climate emergency, and gender. And how do we do this uh, audience-based journalism and social conversation? Well, those conversations takes almost two weeks. 
and they are divided into three phases on our multiple channels. Uh, the first phase is talk, the second one is understand, and the last one is add. When we talk, we talk with our audience, so we collect stories and perspectives from them. In the second phase, we call experts to explain the problems with evidence. And the last one, ACT, is when we develop content that citizens can use them to act or to do something about the problems. I like to share some examples of the type of content that we produce in each phase. This one, for example, the, the phase one, which is talk, uh, we ask questions to our audience on digital channels. So for example, here we ask them, if you had to describe a young Colombian people in a war, what war it should be? And after that, we synthesize the results in a new content. In the second phase, like uh, understand, we produce a type of content more classical to journalism, like infographic, journalistic report, panel with experts. And the last one, ACT, we produce a content that, as I said before, citizens could use in their daily life. For example, here is a guide to talking to a climate change denier. So we synthesize points of conflicts and arguments for response or a guide to talking about labor harassment uh, in your job. So when, who, how, uh, do you have, could you have uh, that conversation? Also, we do glossaries, directories. Well, this kind of uh, practical tools uh, is, is uh, the last kind of content we produce. And the thing is that because of the conversations, we produce this whole content and we have a, a, a library with a lot of materials, but we don't do anything with those contents after the conversations. Uh, that's why we are so interested in the topic of, of this webinar, which is <laughs> how can we uh, turn this content in, in digital product, uh, which could be, which could have more life, you know, that's, that's the thing for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I know that you've prepared quite a few questions on this topic for Paula, so I will just give you the floor and, and start, start asking them. <laughs> <laughs> great, that's great. Well, um, I like to start from the beginning. I mean, uh, how Nexo find or define the digital pro, uh, product that you are going to offer? I mean, of course, every journalist know how to produce editorial content, but how to turn it in a digital product? Uh, where do the ideas come from? Or, I don't know if you could tell us a bit about that. Sure, I think there are different levels when you think about your digital product. I think the first one I would address is your editorial model. For us, in our case, it was clear since we're launching Brazil, is it has a media ecosystem that is very traditional, very concentrated with uh, media companies who are 100 years old. and when we were about to launch a new uh, uh, media organization, digital only, for us it was important to understand what is lacking in this ecosystem. So what can we offer that is not being offered by the traditional, the legacy players? I think this is one element. So what can you offer that is not being offered? I think this is a basic reflection that anyone is making, anyone offering a product is it's making. What are you in a good position to offer as well, because what's your repertoire? What are your skills? What's your team? Uh, and how can you innovate? How can you bring something new uh, that builds your brand? So I think that from an editorial perspective, there are all these elements that helped us think what we were going to offer. So, and then there is this, so 
I think that we wanted to, we were pioneers in Brazil in the sense of bringing the explanatory journalism context to the news. We were very much inspired by different experiences around the world, but there wasn't, there wasn't something that there was, this was not something that was being done in Brazil. So I think that to bring something new was the first element. But then re relating to what I started talking about, I think that for us, it was important also being a small organization not to produce content that would lose value five minutes five minutes after it was published. So if you're after a scoop, it's super important. It might bring a lot of audience uh, to you, but then someone else, your neighbor is going to replicate that. And in 15 minutes, people will be able to find that information in many places. So we wanted to create content that was very unique. If you're, if you're going to put it behind a paywall, you, you have to make it sure that some people won't find it for free, the same thing on a different website. So you need to create something that is very unique, that people really be willing to pay for. If you, if you were gonna put, if your business model tells you that you're gonna put it behind a paywall. If, you're, if your business model involves advertisement, I think it's a whole different game because you wanna attract audience for the click uh, and then you think about your product in a different way. You publish shorter stories, maybe your titles are more juicy. So you, you need to attract, get that, that person to click on your content. For us, it was the idea of creating something that was very unique, that helped us being, uh, build our brand, uh, that contributes to people to understand what we were about. So we're a new organization, we're doing this kind of things. And more importantly, that make people see the value in what we were producing. So I think that from an editorial model, these were the things that we, we took into account when think, reflecting about what kind of product we would like to offer to our audience. But then there is the day-to-day, -day, which I think is completely, it's totally different. When you start to understand your audience, we recently did a research uh, survey with our subscribers. It was super interesting. And then you, th you start to think about product in a bigger way than only your editorial content. So you think about your newsletters, you think about uh, uh, the editorial content on different formats. So I think there, then you start to relate more to your audience, understand what makes sense to them. Also understand where you have room to innovate, uh, starting from your, your relationship with your audience. So I think once you're up and running is a whole different thing and you have to listen a lot. Ah, and one thing that I forgot that I think for us was super important and it is super important when it comes to thinking about editorial content is the skills that you have in your team. We have a team uh, that is super talented with uh, many different backgrounds. And I think that this is key to the content that we produce, to the kind of journalism that uh, we bring to our audience, because we are very creative. People collaborate a lot. They, they bring different repertoires. They bring different uh, uh, knowledge, different skills. So I think that the team, the team you have and the kind of talent and skills that you have on your team is also key to shape um, your product, uh, your editorial product. Thank you, Paula. Maybe to, to understand a bit more about Nexo, could you explain us the, the business model you mentioned? You said that the 60% is uh, sustained, sustained by subscribers. So your own audience is paying for the contents and what, what do they receive and what, are, what is the other 40%? So uh, we have, I'm going to talk about us pre-COVID because uh, since uh, COVID, we have every COVID, uh, COVID content outside of the paywall because we think it's our role to, like there's a lot of misinformation about COVID in Brazil and we believe is our role to give access, free access to people uh, regarding COVID content. Um, but Nangsu has originally a meter paywall. So you can, read some things until you reach the paywall. 
once you reach the payroll, you're invited to subscribe to Nexo. So you have, it oscillates. So you have three contents for free. We are, for a period we had five, it was three. Um, and then you were invited to subscribe to Nexo thing. Like we are an independent, like support our independence. And I think that it's great that media companies discuss a, a business model because I think that sustainability is key to independence. I think it's, uh, I mean, these two things are, uh, uh, um, they must uh, walk together. So we invite people to subscribe and that's how we convert subscribers. And also we, 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 we go there and we talk to people. So if you register for some of our, our newsletters, at some point, we're gonna invite you to subscribe. Like, have you seen that we, do, we did this, this, this? Would you like to support Nexo? So we have some small campaigns. We have a big marketing campaign coming out uh, in the beginning of next year, inviting people to support us and subscribe to our journalism and have access to everything. So what is everything? So you have access to all our content. So you can read uh, a Nexo entirely. You have exclusive newsletters. We have a newsletter that is exclusive to our subscribers. Uh, you have a discount on our courses. Uh, you have a list of benefits, uh, which are the benefits of a subscriber. Uh, we are considering, we have one very popular newsletter that we're cons considering making subscriber, uh, subscribers only. I think this could be an important uh, uh, tool. Uh, to convert subscribers, particularly the, the low hanging fruit. I mean, the subscribers who consume your content a lot every day, who already have a relationship uh, with you. But I, I, I like to think of us as a hybrid organization in the sense that yes, we do all this to convert subscribers. So we have a paywall, we have newsletters, we talk, we have email marketings. We, now we are with a campaign, give Nexo as a gift. So we have a special packages. We have an exclusive, exclusive agreement with the New York Times in Brazil. We sell a bundle subscription next to New York Times. So there's a lot of things that we do to convert subscribers. But as I was telling you, I think I see ourselves as a hybrid organization because the mission appeal is also very strong. So we have a part of our subscribers that subscribe to Nexo because they want to support our journalism. Therefore, there are a lot of things that we do uh, as a media organization, a lot of projects, a lot of institutional initiatives. They're responsible to create to create this relationship that we have with our readers, making them willing to support Nexo as a media organization. So I can give you some examples. So we have for instance, we donate subscriptions to uh, students who are preparing to the exam that gives access to university. So low-income students who are preparing to the exam. So how do we do this? We tell our readers, access to university is a key element to social mobility. There is literature showing that if you read the newspaper every day, you have a better uh, chance of doing good in this kind of exam. So come here, support a subscription, next we'll double it. So we have someone supporting subscription, we double it. So we are selling subscriptions, but with a purpose. We're supporting the student in a moment that he needs to study to an exam that is important in his personal trajectory. So it's something that is important from a business perspective, is important from a brand perspective, and it has impact. So I think we, we are always thinking about initiatives that relate to the core of our business, but also relate to the core of our mission. This is how these two things for me uh, walk together. And I have other examples that I can give you um, further in our conversation. That's great. And you mentioned the courses that, for example, subscribers have discounts on the courses. So I understand that courses are one of your products. And uh, besides the subscribers, how do you 
how do you do those courses? How do you sell them? And do you use the material you, you already produce to, to do those courses? How, how so, yeah, the courses where they, they meet, I think that we, we adopt the same idea. The idea of curation is a strong idea within Nexo. We have a subscribers only newsletter where we, it's called What We Are Reading where we recommend readings from different vehicles around the world. Uh, we have uh, on our homepage, Nexo Recomenda, which Nexo recommends, which are like, we are recommending pieces from different outlets in Brazil. So we're big on curation. We want our reader to know that we are looking for everything that is good he can find in Nexo. Um, and the courses, they share the same principle. So we think about topics that are important to our readers uh, related to current affairs, uh, professional affairs, and we bring professors to uh, um, teach these courses. We did them um, in our newsroom. We had a space in our newsroom. It was a big hit for the first year that we did. We did it a second uh, uh, time and then came COVID. So now we're moving, we're, I think we're gonna have them in our newsroom, but we are also partnering with an organization so we can offer them um, a, a streamed version of the courses. So I think that the appeal here, I mean, there are a lot of people offering courses nowadays, especially after we had to stay home. Um, I think that the strong appeal that ours have is that they are very high quality and they, have, they are very much related to our vision. Uh, so either we're talking about data visualization, which is something that Nexo is big, or we're talking about, um, we had a, 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 a theory of change. It's, it has to do with our audience as well, the interests of our audience and the kind of teachers that we can bring to, our, uh, um, to, to teach these courses. So there is a shared principle there between the vision for Nexo and the courses as well. That's great. So, well, I'm interested on in that because as I said before, we have a lot of materials and we are interested on in doing something like educational with that. That's why uh, I'm, in, I'm interested on in that experience. Yeah. Laura, I think that there, there's a point that it's very important for us to discuss, which is because I'm, I'm here telling you the, like the, the story. So the story is always very pretty. I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you a lot. So this is what we envision and that's what we do. I think there is a, an element there. It's a challenge like, okay, you can have an, a brilliant idea and you can make it happen. But then for a business to, for, for the idea to make sense to a business, you have to ask yourself, how can, how can you scale that? And this is something that we have been questioning ourselves about several of these initiatives. So I think that the courses, the, the possibility of doing a streamed version of them is something that it changes. I mean, uh, the margin that you can have there and then you can scale and then you can reach people. Brazil is a huge country, so you can reach people in the entire country. So I think the scale dimension is very important. But then there is the public as well, because when you're, I, I'm listening to you and I'm seeing your, uh, the materials you, you guys are producing, what we launched an initiative called Nexo Edu, which is grouping Nexo content to students. So high school students and, and teachers. And I think the idea was great. And I think that our content, we know is very much used within the classroom. It's very useful to teachers. But then there is a challenge, there was a challenge there. It was like, we don't have a sales force to sell to schools in our organized way. This is what we realized. You can have the product, you can have a fit. I mean, you can all, oh, is it useful? Yes, it is useful. Uh, do the teachers see value? Yes, they see value. And we know that because we get a lot of feedback, but then you have to sell it. And to sell it to schools, you need to have a sales force that is organized, understands the school environment and compete with everyone else that is selling a hundred other things to the schools. And we realize this is not our business. So we try to try, and then we said, we're not gonna be successful unless we wanna build a business 
that like is focused on selling material to schools at least in brazil we won't be able to do that this way so after trying for a couple of years now we partner with a, a, a business that is a business that sells content digital content to schools our margin is much smaller but the scale is a whole different game it, it goes to a scale it will go to a scale that we would never be able to reach being in a major organization so it's also about knowing i mean who you are i mean we are not uh, an organization that will have a huge sales force calling a school every day hi hi do you want to buy um, my material so there is this distance between having a good product and being able to monetize it uh, and, and when it, uh, when you want to have scale in this kind of monetization so for at least for us this was a challenge and we thought it was best to partner with a business who which has this as its core activity so you have a commercial team which sells your editorial content in general and subscriptions and everything but for nexo edu you have a different commercial team which is a partner great right and uh, yeah that's interesting and about the, the scalable of those products i mean with this partner you can scale on the yeah the monetization but regarding the production of those contents is the same content that you offer to subscribers that you offer is the same content or you have to adapt it to to be an educational tool is the same content it's not everything that we offer to the schools but it's the same content we didn't see i mean it for us it wouldn't be worth if we had to rework redo those contents it wouldn't make sense because then and and we thought about that we thought should we have someone with an educational background that would group all of this into a specific material but then we realized that we would be entering a territory that is not ours which is like producing content educational content uh, we thought it was smarter and would make sense for us to keep our identity like young people need to read the news and we have a great format for them to read the news so let's stick to what we are we're news in an amazing format with very uh, uh, um, good high quality content uh, bringing a lot of data we partner i mean we now we have for instance a series about um science and scientists so we cover a lot of different topics we are good to be in the classroom but we are a news organization i think that making this decision and not trying to be uh someone who is producing educational content for us was important i don't i don't know if this is the answer to everyone and probably it's not but i think that for us was an important decision to to move like that that's great and i have to go to questions about that uh, one is well, you said that you realized that you weren't able and it wasn't make sense to to transform this content. How did you realize of that? You tried it first and after that you changed your mind because it's interesting for us also to know how to decide when to uh, go ahead with the project and when to say no it's not working and we have yes. to to change oh. the way <laughs> that's a very i mean i wish we had this perfect moment was oh no okay let's give up it's not gonna work sometimes you try longer than you should but sometimes also you like you try longer than you like okay this is not gonna and then you try a little bit more and then it works so it's really hard i mean uh, uh, for you to know exactly when you should give up I think that for us, what happened was like, we are a young organization. So everything was about trying and it still it is. We're still trying things. And sometimes you get it right. Sometimes you get it wrong and you need to be comfortable with that. I, I think that, I mean, you need to learn from these experiences and not to make the same mistake, but you can't, I mean, 
we cannot be afraid of making mistakes too much because if if you have this kind of mindset it's really hard for you to grow and to build new things and i mean you have to take a, some risk so what happened with us is that we were super excited with this perspective to work with educational organizations and schools and so on and then we had the chance to work with a huge educational organization who saw a lot of value in our content and it was like they were making the digital transition and they were like oh this is going to fit perfectly and then we worked together with them and then what we realized is that they needed to have their own content the idea that they could use ours to replace theirs wasn't a realistic one and the idea that we could shape their needs also wasn't a realistic one i think that what this is what we learned people have their needs and maybe your material will adapt to their needs maybe it won't uh, but for you to expect to shape their needs i think it's something that we realize it wouldn't uh, work so i think that it's more about you understanding the user's need realizing if you are able to build something from that kind like your diagnostic then the other way around so we're hoping that they would adapt to the content that we have i think they were hoping as well and then we, they realized they didn't and for us was like one big lesson that okay people and now what we have today is that people that use our content as it is so maybe it's a smaller number but then it's less work for us and i think it's more sustainable as well because it doesn't make us try to become something that we are not as a business so yeah yeah that's great because i think that's the thing that make them scalable is, is the, the the yeah the big thing <laughs> don't work uh, more than than you can of course and uh, about this what what you were saying about adaptation and everything i like to know how does your commercial team in general approach clients do you offer closed products or do you personalize the product you offer to the clients what's your strategy on that yeah so i think that one part of, i mean one thing i would like to share with you i think we didn't see ourselves as, um we built an organization around the newsroom we see we saw ourselves as, as a media organization and when it took us a while to realize that a media organization also is a sales organization a media organization also has clients it took, like once you have a subscription model you have clients and it took us to, a while to realize that uh, and so we didn't even have a team in place to uh get complaints to answer questions we're like and everyone's like oh my god we have clients so we have to have a team a customer that that deal with customer not client customers so it took us a while to realize that and we also thought about sales as something that should happen organically and because they did at the beginning so subscription happened very organically uh partners would come to us we assumed that the right course would be for things to happen in an organic way which is amazing when you're starting and you're building a brand and, but it's of course not enough so i think uh, and we kind of got like it took us a while so like this is good but is is not what enough is not what we need to really grow and pay the bills and everything so i think that the idea of building a proper sales team is the first thing that you need to address within an organization when i say that we build an, a media organization around a newsroom is because at the beginning our focus was entirely like what kind of product from an editorial perspective are we putting out in the world and i think it's right and if your product is good your life is, is going to be much easier when you have to sell it 
but it doesn't mean that you're the selling part of it is done even if you have a good product you have to have a lot of effort to sell it so we don't the way we see it things are a little bit mixed so we have subscriptions that they're under the, the team that works with distribution and marketing. And why is that? Because we have a very good conversion rate. So for us, it's about reaching people. So it's about how efficiently we're capable of distributing our content. So we're able to reach people. We know we're going to convert. This is when I'm talking about um, uh, subscriptions. Then we have partners, uh, people who, when we do like projects, this is another revenue stream. So when we do some projects, they're supported by certain partner. Uh, so for instance, we have now a UN agency who support her, a specific editorial uh, project that took us a whole year. So this is a supported content. They reached out for us. So we, 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 started, we started building relationship with key actor players in brazil because of the kind of content that we produce they reach out for us and sometimes of course we reach out for them as well when they have an idea and we think there's a good match there so i think that and but then we don't address as sales we address as a partnership we are building independent editorial product that will have an impact on public debate that at some point aligns with the mission of this particular organization who is working with this particular topic. So I don't see this as a sales effort, but it's more of a partnership. And we have launched a platform called Nexo Politicas Publicas, which works very much in this kind of model. So Nexo Politicas Publicas was created trying to address uh, one of the biggest challenges for me when it comes to communication, which is in our last electoral cycle in Brazil, uh, the public debate was very aggressive, zero rational, and we were talking about things that, had, that were supported by a lot of evidence. Brazil has excellence in a series of research fields. And we were talking about things that had a lot of uh, uh, evidence, uh, supported by a lot of evidence, as comparing them to things who had no evidence at all. And they were put at the same level in the debate. So uh, on the at the same time, there was a challenge there. was like, Brazilians use a lot of WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp a lot. And a lot is an understatement, I would say like crazy. Uh, and an academic paper is something that you don't share uh, in your family WhatsApp group. So we can also, let's think about a different format. Let's think how we can communicate scientific findings better. How can we communicate evidence better? And then we create Nexo Public Policy, which is a platform that we work with some of the most incredible research centers in Brazil and in the world. We have brilliant partners producing uh, their academic findings into our, our formats, editorial formats that we created. And this platform is supported by a group of foundations which work, they, these foundations work with the topics that we address in the platform, like racial issues, climate issues, energy, uh, inequality. So they support the platform because they support these topics and we address these topics in the platform and the platform is uh no paywall free access because of the kind of content that we want people to be able to access for free so i think this is a win-win um project because it brings funds to us uh it allows us to bring content to decision makers, researchers, teachers, professors, high quality content for free. And it gives visibility to scientists who are under attack in Brazil. Universities are going through a lot of cuts and so on. So it has all these dimensions. That's why I don't like to think as a project like this, although it involves a business dimension. For me, it's not a commercial project. It's a project that ticks all those boxes. It's important from a business perspective, but it's also important because it's responding to our mission. 
uh, is playing a role in our public debate, is giving visibility to the academic content that is being produced in Brazil. Right, and I think it's pretty interesting that you mention a lot your partners. I mean, uh, you have partners to sell your educational content, but you also have partners to produce content. And I think that helped you to, yeah, to make it more scalable, as, as we said before. And how do they, or I think that could be a clue for us because for example, we do social conversation or citizen conversation, but our team is able to do one conversation each every two weeks, but we cannot do more conversations than that. How do you teach those partners or how is the relation uh, because uh, that make it possible that they do materials or content in your way? How do you do that? So this has been a very interesting journey uh, because I always tell the story that the first research center, rich, uh, research center with whom I, which I sit to discuss the idea, I told them, so we're, the idea is to do this and that. And they asked me how many pages? Because they are thinking about an academic paper. It's like, this is not about that. We're, we're talking about new formats. So we designed the formats, glossary, a timeline, ask a researcher uh, questions that science has answered. So we created these formats and we present, introduced the formats to them. So it was a learning experience from both sides. And I think it's also for them interesting because the training to think about their knowledge in a different way. You're not writing to your peers. Uh, you're writing to someone else and someone else that needs to have access to what you're producing. So we are learning all the time. So it's, there's a lot of exchange. The platform has an editor that works very closely with the research center, uh, centers. And it's very important that she works close with them because it's a way of building and learning and adapting these formats or in some time saying, you know, this is too big, <laughs> you need to cut it or, or when like rehearsing a video and so on. But addressing your first point, when you're talking about your material, I think that one thing that also it could be interesting and I'm talking about what without having seen uh, the material, but I think that sometimes we, the people that produce, the things, we tend to see them as a whole that cannot be touched. And the value is in this whole thing. And I think that sometimes you can have smaller versions of the same content that could be used in different circumstances, that could be used to engage people in a different moment, that would have value to people in a way that we are not seeing it. Because as I am understanding, you're producing very high quality content that has that resonates a lot because it's a result of a conversation. So it speaks a lot to what people uh, uh, um, are thinking of. So I imagine there are multiple uses to the content that you're producing. Uh, I, I can see this being used in different circumstances, in different formats, a shorter version, a longer version, and so on. And I think this is the beauty of a digital product because you can, for, for instance, now we have launched a new format, which is an animated, a narrated graphic, infographic. It's a very short infographic that is narrated. And the idea here is like, are you delivering the same kind of information and to the extent that you would deliver in an infographic that is published in our home? No, you're not. But then if the person wants, she can go to our website, but then you're delivering something in a format that might engage, might engage people that wouldn't go to your homepage to see an infographic. So I think that we sometimes have a hard time saying, okay, I will deliver a little bit less, uh, but high quality still. And this will be a, a door 
to people who uh, doesn't know our content yet. Right, thank you. Um, my last question would be about technology. I mean, how <laughs> how the, the technology is integrated in your day-to-day -day work? I, I think all you mentioned and all the websites, uh, it's obvious that technology is important in exceptional, and I like to know the, the whole uh, yeah, idea you have on that. Yeah. So technology is key, you're absolutely right. And I remember when we were doing our research uh, to design Nancy and so on, that, that, that innovation report from the New York Times was leaked and we were reading the report and so on. And there was something there about bringing the engineers, bringing the developers to the center of the newsroom. There was something, this was a very like modern concept, like developers are not developing a website, they are part of the team. And for us, this was a very important concept from the start. Uh, so we have uh, the technology team today, we have, uh, uh, it's 10 people, so it's big to an organization uh, as ours. Our technology director is someone who is with us. He was the, sec the, fir the second person that I hired. Uh, so he's with us, he's the very start. He's someone who fully understands and believes in, uh, our, in our editorial model. And I think this is key because what they are doing there is they're, they're producing content as much as a journalist is. Uh, if you go to something like we, we, we publish, when we publish things, we have, we credit everyone, the, the journalist, the developer, the data scientist. Sometimes we have pieces in Excel uh, which are uh, signed by five people because these are all the people who are involved in that content. So I think that to see uh, developers like that, for us at least was very important. Then I think that what we have been investing a lot is building a common language, with a, which I think is a huge, huge challenge. And I think this is something that media organizations should really invest in such conversations, could be a next topic for a conversation like this because to have a common language is really really hard because you're talking about different uh, uh, ways of seeing deadlines you're talking about different ways of seeing products you're talking about different ways of thinking about the, how the world is organized and you need to build a common ground and it's really hard because there is a technical part of it that you don't necessarily understand and you shouldn't need to but you need to come closer at some point. So I think this is something that we've been trying to do, get some tech knowledge literacy around the whole organization at a minimum. Being a native digital organization, you have to have a minimum of technology literacy. Everyone should have that. Uh, so we can start at, at some point, have a minimum common language that allowed us to move together Otherwise, it's really, really hard to plan to and to do collaborate and to exchange. And um, how do you do that? <laughs> Is the, the technology owner in charge of that? Or could you give us, a, I don't know, an example of, of the experience of that? Yeah, so we have uh, been using planning, some planning tools that are helping us. Uh, and I think that this, like, to, to do a collaborative planning is important. Uh, we have tech people sitting in editorial meetings. And I think this is super important because it's not like, oh, here is a project. Your job now is to develop it. It's like, let's discuss the entire project. And this is how we learn because then it's, oh, no, but you want to do this, that it, like, it goes upside down. This will take us. 20 years to develop, is, is, is it worth it? Is it key to the, your editorial goal in this? Or you just wanna do this because we can do this. And so you start to learn when you work together, when you really work together from the start, you start to learn what, what it matters to the other team. So you don't propose something that makes no sense or, and, and then you make the right questions as well. So for instance, we realized that 
when we say it's done for us, for, for editorial, it means it's ready to be published. For technology, when it's done, it means it's ready to be tested. So it took us a while and, and then, so now we have like, it's done in one thing, it, it, it's done means when it's ready to be published. Let's say it's ready to be tested. So, but it's the language, I mean, it's, it seems like a detail, but when you're working with deadlines, and of course it makes sense when you say it's done, it's ready to be tested because it's what, it, it is when it's gonna be published and you're gonna be able to navigate it and to check all the user experience. So it, it makes sense to consider it done because you're gonna do the adjustments. And of course, when you are sitting on the editorial side, you don't think about, oh, I need to test the user experience. Like the text is, is there, you don't need to test it. So I think that working together is how you build this common language and you start to understand what does it matter to the other team? And you start to think about their work as well and not only yours. You mentioned that your conversion works very well. If I understood well, you said that the, the challenge is to distribute your content and to reach the audience. But once you reach them, the conversion works well. How do you do this conversion? Why, why do you think your conversion rate is so good? Uh, I well, I, what, we, what, what we believe is that I think it's a combination of things. I think that as I, I was telling you, we produce things that are unique. So you don't find it for free somewhere else. So you really, so we have specific things that convert very well. So infographics convert well, interactive convert well, some colonists convert well. So things are very exclusive to us, they convert well. If we do something that is like our exclusive reporting converts well, so we can follow that. So everything that has this unique appeal, I think it converts well. I think also I, we have a great relationship with our readers. We're part of the Trust Project. We are very transparent and we communicate a lot with our audience. So if we make a mistake, we have, I think I'd like to think that we have a more horizontal relationship with our audience. And I think that for a long time, media organizations have a very asymmetric relationship with their audience. I'm here to tell you how the world works and you're there to learn from me. And I think that the world is, the world is no longer like that. So we listen a lot to our readers. So if there is a mistake, if there's a critic, if there is a compliment, so we get a lot of public endorsements. And I think this, it's very important. So because more than we saying we are a great media organization, we have another reader saying, this is a great media organization. So yesterday, for instance, we launched our Pre Give It Nexo as a present campaign. And on Instagram, there is a comment, the best. So it's a super good, I mean, it's, it's better than any other kind of marketing endorsement that we could have any kind of marketing campaign is the reader saying, I'm a subscriber and I think it is the best. So I think that that's why the relationship with, we have with, what, with our audience is so much important for us. And that I, we don't, we're not willing to put that into, at stake for absolutely nothing. It's something that is really hard for you to build. Uh, and I think it has, uh, it's very, very valuable. And I think, so this, it's a combination of all these things that that's why I believe we have such a good conversion rate. Um, I think sorry. that we have, oh yes. Yeah. Um, we don't have any questions right now. So maybe Laura, we have a few more minutes. Maybe you have a final question for Paula. Yeah, and it's exactly about this, um, what you mentioned about the, the relation with the audience. How do you, uh, yeah, how do you keep it or how do you, or does the technology help you to keep this relation? 
That's an excellent question and a very troubling one because I think that, I mean, one thing is for you to have this clarity about, okay, this is a priority. And then you're very present on social uh, media channels. You answer everyone. You're very careful with your tone, your voice. We have a policy, how you answer and so on. And then you start to grow. And how do you do this with scale again? So we're using different tools now to group uh, the communication so we can address uh, different channels. Sometimes people write us in three different channels and then we have three different people addressing the same question. So we're using technology to organize this. Uh, I think that also what we do is to revisit our voice constantly because this is something that you need to be very, um, you need to pay a lot of attention because you come up with, well, this is our voice. This is how we want to address uh, people. And then you start to do that and then you get used to that. And then you have, you don't revisit once you have a different challenge, a different question. So you need to revisit all the time. But the scale is again a challenge. If you want to keep this like intimate or at least close relationship with your audience, you certainly need to, I was reading about this uh, last week on uh, artificial intelligence and how it can help you. And I think that is something that we, uh, it is absolutely necessary to, uh, to make you able to organize when this gains a whole different scale. Thank you. I, I do have one question now. Um, Shiar asks if you have an app as an exogenal, and if so, how many people use and download it compared to the yes. number of subscribers? So Shiar, we don't have an app. We're about to launch it. It's going to probably be launched in February. Uh, we, at the beginning, we decided that we wouldn't have an app uh, and that the, the, the mobile experience should be as good as the, the desktop experience. But there's a problem there, which is like today to have, um, to be able to, for instance, send push notifications. I think it changes the game. It's important for you to be present in different moments of, uh, of your reader's uh, day. So we're about to launch an app in February and we are considering making it exclusively to subscribers. I, I'm not sure about that, but I think when you're a small organization, this is the kind of thinking that you need to have if you want to make people convert. Because, for instance, I'm a lazy subscriber. Uh, I only subscribe to things, even if I want to, when I cannot use them. So, for instance, if I, so you need to, to make people, um, you, you need to find ways to make people subscribe, even if they want to, if they're, if they're willing to, they won't do until you, you make them. So you create an opportunity for them to do so. So the, the app might be another opportunity for us to convert some subscribers. Thank you. Um, I think we should come to a close. So Paula, thank you so much for sharing all of this knowledge. And Laura, thank you for the excellent questions. And uh, I hope we will be in touch. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. And Laura, thank you so much for all the super interesting questions, challenging questions. They make me think a lot. They made me think a lot. <laughs> thank you, Paula. You sum up your ideas so well that uh, they are very interesting learnings for us. Really, thanks.